Welcome to The Mind of Money. My name is Douglas Lodmel, and I really have a treat for you today. I have fellow asset protection attorney, Jeffrey Verdon here. Jeffrey, welcome. Thank you, it's nice to be here. Yeah, so um, I've had one other asset protection uh, attorney on, Howard, of course, who you know and, and, and I know, and it's, it was a really popular topic. And it's funny because this show is The Mind of Money, it's all things money. I happen to be an asset protection attorney, and I guess, a lot of people are interested in this who are already watching this show. So um, what we have to talk about today, what I'd like to talk about is um, really your perceptions about what's going on out there. Because if you're like me, you have a lot of clients and, and they give you a unique perspective that most people don't have. I mean, you see through the eyes of, of really wealthy people what's going on. And um, I'm curious what you see. Well, you're right. It is a very interesting time. Uh, I've been a lawyer now 34 years. Yeah. Uh, I've been an asset protection lawyer as part of our estate planning practice since about 1985. Yeah. And over that period of time, I've been through two, three major recessions. Yeah. And every time we have a recession, our, our asset protection business increases because of the number of lawsuits that are filed. Right. <laughs> But the recession we had, the Great Recession, as they've coined this it one, in, in yeah. 2008, yeah. has really been extraordinary in terms of how it's evolved and who it's impacted. Yeah. In the past, you have your typical uh, victims of the recession. You have the, the entrepreneurs, yeah. your risk takers, your venture capital people, yeah. your real estate developers. They're the ones that typically have the boom bust cycles. Yeah. And they lo lose their money, they accept the risk, and they build it back, and they come back, and they, they build up their next fortune. They're used to it in a way. They're used I mean, to they, it. They can handle it. They, they, that's, that's the job that they yeah. wanted to go into. Right. The 2008 cycle was very different. The 2008 cycle, we had uh, just about everybody who could breathe and sign their name and could, could, could get credit. They would buy four or five, six houses. Right. They leveraged themselves up to the hilt. They created this false sense of security, of, of, of and wealth. wealth. Yeah. And then when it all collapsed, you had ordinary people who had been involved and subjected to extraordinary events. And right. now they were suddenly out of money. They owed millions of dollars to banks. They were basically broke. And, and that type, the ordinary citizen out there is not used to the boom bust cycles like venture capitalists and real estate developers are. And what I found was that, that this group of people, the way they would react was so vitriolic yeah. that they would default to their primary uh, instincts. Their, their primal instincts, I think, is, a, is the, a term coined by some psychologists many years yeah. ago. And their behavior was just absolutely vitriolic. So you had a much bigger and broader impact of lawsuits. So you're saying they went down to survival mode almost. They went to survival mode yeah. and they circled the wagons and they did whatever they could to try to recapture uh, whatever they lost. And it wasn't very successful, but you have a willing uh, community, the trial lawyers, yeah. who gladly... Who gla <laughs> they're not willing, are they? <laughs> they're willing. They, like, they need to feed their families That's also. True. And so you wound up with, a, with a, a, a perfect storm. You had uh, trial lawyers who were willing to take these cases on. You had victims who, you know, in this country, we're not willing to accept responsibility for our own actions. Yeah, you noticed that, huh? So those people who were, who were trying to recapture the money by, by initiating the lawsuit lottery. I yeah. know this very uh, astute author that wrote a book called The Litigation Lottery. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and so you, you had that enormous uh, impact. Uh, and so I, we, see, we see the litigation yeah. explosion hitting a much uh, more base part of the society than we had in, in years past. Well, that's a great way to put it. You know, nobody's really put it just that way, but you're absolutely right. I mean, what happened in this Great Recession is, was just very different. Um, and you're right, it's, not, it's people who, one, they probably weren't used to the wealth to begin with. They kind of fell into it with the, the whole real estate boom. They parlayed it up. Um, and all of a sudden, on paper, they're worth two or three million dollars. And then it's, it's gone like that. And you even had granny and grandpa. Yeah, participating in this buying and flipping houses, and next yeah. thing you know, you know they leveraged their their free and clear house, and and, and and they lost their investments, and now their their kids are faced with having to support grandma and grandpa, and it's yeah. it's just been a very unique time. And so what you have is a mentality. When I sit down to to do a client's estate planning, which mm -hmm. is I'm basically by my background and training an estate planning lawyer. Yeah, asset protection is something that we feel is important because of the. Uh, just the, the impact of litigation in this country for the last 50 or 100 years. Uh, we want to make sure there's an estate 
to pass on to the children right. and one to retire on. So asset protection is generally part of an overall estate plan that we do in our office. But uh, this, this period, especially when you sit down to talk about wealth transfer, which is what an estate planner is primarily doing. He's, yeah. he's trying to transfer as much wealth to the next generation with the least amount of administrative costs and taxes. And the idea of a, of a, a, a person giving away their wealth and trust to their children is just so antithetical to their belief system having lost you know, half of what they had in the 2008 Great Recession. It's been very much, a, very much of a challenge to get our clients to do the appropriate tax planning because they don't want to give up property that they that they have because you know they're I guess still the, feeling the pain of the loss. There's, there's an old expression: you know, you can never be too rich or too thin. Yeah, and and, and, and with with estate <laughs> planners, uh, you, you, not so rich. They're at not. That. <laughs> it, it, they're being very selfish right now. They're not yeah, giving up their property, and, and and right now especially, yeah. there are some wonderful planning opportunities uh, in in the gift and estate tax area because of the, the the temporary but generous increases they've given us that expire at the end of this year. And we're trying to encourage our clients to take advantage of that because once it's gone, it's never coming back. And yet people are so, they have such uh, deep memories of the recession of 2008 that it's very hard to get clients to take the appropriate planning steps unless you have the tools to, to enable them to be able to recapture their, their assets once they made the transfers. Well, it's interesting because um, you know, this, this, this great recession that we're in, there's a couple of stories out there right now about where we're at. One is, is that the worst of it is behind us and we're, we're on the upswing and you know, we're, we have muddled through it and it's time to get back to business in America. The other is, is that we have kicked the can down the road, we've prolonged um, uh, the pain and inevitably we're gonna have to actually take a bigger reset back. Through the eyes of your clients, what, which of those stories do you find you see more of out there? Well, to your first point, I think the, the idea that we, we, the worst is behind us. I think that comes to us a lot through the press. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think if there's any uh, administration that's guilty of that, I think the Obama administration would like the public to believe, and they have of a willing, <laughs> they have a willing accomplice in the, in the national press, yeah. that uh, because corporations are showing better Robert, earnings and, yeah. and, and the stock market really, the stock market doesn't really reflect, in my humble opinion, what's really happening on, on, on Main Street. Yeah. Uh, the idea that we've kicked this down the road, I mean, if, if I'm not a, an, an economist, uh, I'm not even a student of, a, of economics. Do you play I, one on TV? Ever? I play one on TV, <laughs> but, but I'm fortunate enough to sit in yeah. on these planning meetings with my wealthy clients. So our, our, our clientele are generally the high net worth families, sure. and they, they have advisors that study this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I sit in these meetings and I get to listen. I, I speak at conferences like the Freedom Fest, which is a libertarian conference where they get some very, very good speakers like yeah. Steve Forbes come in and, and, and talk about uh, you know what's going on, and uh, you, you, people like Peter Schiff, who, who I've watched speak and I'm familiar with his work, and, and you can't defy. You know, e e economics is one of those natural laws. You just yeah. can't change the natural law of economics. And eventually, you can kick the can down the road. You can delay the, the mm -hmm. impact, but ultimately. Uh, the, the, the smart money in this country, they've already taken the necessary steps to protect themselves, so they, they know what's coming. So you, so you think we do have another um, uh, reset coming in some form or another? We have to. I don't know how, I don't know how our interest rates can be so low in, in relation to, you're starting to see the interest rates change with Italy and now France. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, in, in Germany, if you want to put your money with the government, you have to actually pay them, pay them to uh, hold your money. That's happening here too. Yeah. I mean, we have negative yields on treasuries. Right. And, right. You know, we have a divergence in the muni bond market and the tre U.S. Treasury market. It used to be basically just you know, hand in glove. Now they're, they're, they're coming apart as we see, you know, largest muni default in the history of the United States in you know, Jefferson County, Alabama. $3 billion, bigger than Orange County. And very little press about it once it very happened. Very little. You know, yeah. We have the same situation occurring in California. We're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. So, so today, the, our, our wealthy clients, are, the advice they're being given by their advisors yeah. is work on return of capital, not return on capital, yeah. <laughs> and, until we get things stabilized a little bit. Yeah. Well, you know, to that point, um, you, you were alluding to uh, a unique planning opportunity. You know, in the asset protection estate planning world, you're pretty well known and um, you're very creative and, and we know that. Um, I think it's really interesting what you're doing because you've developed something that I love. Um, and I, even what you call it is brilliant. You call it the have your cake and eat it to trust. So the high set trust. So in the simplest terms, what does it do? 
What's the opportunity that's simple? That's I'm a tax right lawyer. We, yeah. <laughs> try, please we, try. We can't we can't talk in simple terms, but it's interesting. You know, part of what we try to do with our clientele is to break down what is a very complicated area of the tax code yeah. in, into understandable bits and pieces, and then convey to our clients how they can use the tax code to build their wealth rather right. than taking uh, unnecessary investment risk. And if you use a tax code intelligently, you can create... Uh, which is which is brilliant. Anytime you can pull risk off the table, you, you've got to do it, especially now. And we, there's so many special interests that have created this enormously complicated document that yeah. there's plenty of opportunities in the tax code yeah. for tax-efficient portfolio management. Right. So at the end of 2010, when the new tax law was passed and oh. we saw it was going to take effect January 1st, one of the most interesting things that jumped out at me with the new tax law is Congress raised the gift tax exclusion, which historically started out at $30,000 yeah. when I first became a lawyer. 19, <laughs> that was 1976 is when it was passed. Wow. In 78, I became a lawyer. Then it went up to $600,000, yeah. then it went to a million dollars, and stayed at a million dollars. And then Congress in 2010, to try to, I guess, pacify, they, they would, this big impasse, if you remember, and they finally yeah. agreed on a bill. Yeah. And the Congress allowed taxpayers to make gifts for a two-year window period from January 1st, 2010 to December 31st, 2012. You can give away up to $5 million per taxpayer. That was right. five times the historical high of how much you, wealth you can transfer. Now, why should we care about that? Well, if you take $5 million, if you're fortunate enough to have that much money or those, mm -hmm. that, that amount in assets, and you can gift it out of your estate without paying any current transfer tax, and you can get a 6% return on average over the next 30 years, that $5 million becomes $29 million. And mm -hmm. if both husband and wife are fortunate enough, and they can both do $5 million at 6%, that's, that's almost, almost $60, 60 million. million. And if you're, uh, if you're a person that invests in private equity or higher yielding mm -hmm. investments, if you can get a 10% return between the two spouses, that's 180 some million dollars that they can mm -hmm. remove from their estate. So, uh, so it's 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 real money, at least where I come from. Yeah. So consequently, how do I convince my clients? Uh, the problem I, I I thought I would encounter is, yeah, we can give away five million dollars, but these people just got hammered by the <laughs> by the Great Recession. How am I going to convince a client? And they're, and they're not sure it's over. <laughs> they're not sure it's over. Yeah. They still have some money left, but they've lost quite a bit. Yeah. How am I going to get convince them that they should take this $5 million and put this into a, a trust for their kids right. when they might need that money back sometime in the future? Right. Now, when the gift tax exclusion was a million dollars, that's not too hard of a, of a bridge to, to, yeah, to, 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 uh, to accomplish. But with, with the $5 million exclusion, I thought it was going to be a challenge. Yeah. Well, you mentioned I'm an asset protection lawyer, and I've been reading some, some cases and some rulings involving an Alaska trust in which uh, the taxpayer set up an Alaska asset protection trust. Yeah made a gift to the trust, included himself in as a discretionary beneficiary of this trust, yeah. used an independent trustee, and the IRS ruled that it was a completed gift. Now, what does that mean in lay terms? That means that a client could set up a trust in a qualifying yeah. jurisdiction, use an independent trustee, and make a completed gift to that trust of this $5 million we're talking about and, and become a beneficiary of the, the trust. Yeah. And the trustee had, was now empowered to be able to kick money back to the beneficiary at the, in the trustee's sole and absolute discretion, no. but only if the beneficiary needed it. Right. So if you have a high net worth individual who wants to make this $5 million transfer, they're, what they're worried about is if I give it to my kids and I need it back, I may not be able to get it. Right. Well, with the high set trust, and by the way, high set stands for have your cake, you need it too. Yeah. It was an acronym that I, because when I read the law and I read this ruling, I thought, well, my clients can have their cake, you need it too. And right. then I put the, the, the letters together and I coined the phrase, I said, uh, I said trust. Yeah. And when I explain the high set trust to my clients, you know, they kind of get it. It's a, it's a fun term. Whereas yeah. we tax lawyers tend to use these overly complicated uh, yeah. nomenclature that, that most people don't understand, like crummy trusts and mm -hmm. dynasty trusts, but the high set trust, they get it. So when I created the high set trust, met with some clients in the early part of January 2011. They like the idea of being able to give the asset away, but get it back it's if they It's almost like having a, a safety emergency escape valve uh, of, of the assets. Well, it's a, safety net. it's a yeah. safety net for people if they should need it. If they don't need it, don't take it out of the trust, right. because if you do, you're only going to gross up your estate. Mm -hmm. Because in 2013, the estate tax laws and the gift tax laws change, 
it goes from ten, $5 million, $10 million per couple, down to a $1 million a person. Yeah. And the estate tax and gift tax rate jump up to 55%, or the, the gift tax rates jump up to 45%, the estate tax rate jumps up to 55% over $12 million. So there's some significant tax increases coming, and this would be a way for our clients to take advantage of that. Well, you know, I mean, uh, as an uh, estate planner, asset protection attorney, um, it, was, it was the law that if you retained any interest whatsoever in a trust, that's it, it's includable in the estate. Um, so this whole concept of being able to have any type of access to that money and have it out of your estate is, is unique. When you told me about it, I said, really? How are you doing it? Um, so it, it's not, you know, it's not, this is not vanilla. This is unique. Well, uh, the, 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 the service ha had ruled in 2009 that this could be done and, and it based its ruling on, on some prior uh, rulings and uh, private letter rulings. Now, a private letter ruling is only uh, primary authority or right. can only be used by the taxpayer who received it right. or who requested it and to whom it was issued but you can get a pretty good idea into the window of how the IRS views these issues by reading these private letter rulings. Right. Um, if you, you have to set the trust up in, in, in an asset protection jurisdiction, in other words a jurisdiction where if you form a trust and it's a self-settled trust mm -hmm. uh, and you, tr you transfer assets to the trust, the creditors cannot reach assets in that trust. Now there are only two jurisdictions in the U.S. out of the 12 asset protection states that have the kind of law that, that would meet this requirement. Ten of the twelve have what's called super creditor carve-outs. So mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you're a certain type of a creditor uh, that the state recognizes and feels should be able to reach assets, then they're, they're, those, they have limitations or exceptions that allow these types of creditors to reach assets in the and trust. the two states are? The, well, the two states are Nevada and Alaska that yeah. do not have these super creditor carve-outs. You can also set the trust up in a, in a country like the Cook Islands, which is where yep. we like to set up our trust, right. asset protection trust. Because even with, with certain state law, there are federal laws sure. that will trump state laws, like bankruptcy. Uh, the, the bankruptcy trustee has mm -hmm. up to 10 years to reach back and, and, and yep. get a transfer out of a, out of a domestic asset protection trust. So we have, for those clients that want to have good, better, or best, we <laughs> typically have a, a solution depending on how protected they want to be. Right, right. So this is really not only have your cake and eat it too, but two birds with one stone. I mean, you're going to get assets out of your state and asset protect them. I mean, really asset That's protect right. them, particularly if you use the offshore it's, it's version. A, it's a very broad-based planning tool that, that even when the laws change in 2013 and the exclusion goes down to a million dollars, this trust still has a great deal of viability. It's, it's a it's, it's a better trust, uh, rather you'll get better results if you use it now while the gift tax exclusion is at $5 million. But even when it goes back to $1 million, I think we'll still be using so it. So for a client who's, let's say they have $10 million, they want it, they, they think that they're going to use this. Um, if they go ahead and complete the gift of $5 million now, let's say they need it back, are they going to have to pay income tax on the, on the income now because it's a discretionary? Well, the, the trust is one of those unique trusts. It's called a grantor trust. And no. the grantor trust is a disregarded trust for income tax purposes. So whatever the income that's earning, that's being earned in the trust, whatever the income, it, taxable income, gets reported on the taxpayers. So you get the full amount of the completed gift now as a deduction? Full amount of the completed gift now, and yet you still pay the income tax okay. on the income. Sure. Now, you may think that that's a negative, but actually no, no, we, we call that tax burn. So you can yeah. further get the benefit of not having to make yeah. additional tax, uh, gifts to the trust by paying the income tax that's associated with that trust. So for, yeah. for a wealthy family, it's a wonderful trust to both protect assets, take advantage of the $5 million exclusion, and then pay the income tax on those assets uh, even though uh, you're reducing your estate and not have it be a taxable gift. Sure, you can pay the income tax from the assets that are outside of the high set That's trust right. and further burn That's it down. That's right. Yeah, fabulous. So the ideal, well, first of all, there's a limited time frame. I mean, we're really talking about this year, at least for the five million, and then it's gonna, it, it, it remains effective, but you lose the, the big contribution. That's right. So for, for your viewers that, 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 that think they may be, have a, a place in, yeah. in their planning for this. It's now. It's now, <laughs> it's, it's, it's at least take a look at it. And yeah. there, you know, we've written some articles on it and, and uh, hopefully this video will be uh, a good uh, teaching tool for, for those, not only for the, the individuals, but for the advisors. Yeah. You know, after I leave you today, I'm gonna be boarding the crystal, beautiful Crystal yeah. Symphony and I'll be giving lectures on yeah. estate planning on the crystal, which I do a couple of times a year. And, 
In the Crystal Cruise Line, they, they typically get a higher, more affluent family, oh, yeah, but they definitely. come from the smallest cities and towns around the country. And a lot of your viewers may have lawyers that don't have the luxury of specializing mm -hmm. in the sort of things that we do. And as I tell my audience, is if your lawyer did the sort of things I'll be talking to you about today, you'd already have it. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you have an attorney or a CPA and you haven't been apprised of the high set trust or something akin to this, uh, it's not that they're doing a bad job for you, but they may not be aware of this. And so yeah. if, you know, feel free to, to contact you or us, and we'll be happy to get whatever materials to them that they want to see. Yeah, well, it, it really is a function of um, access to the information, and it really can make the difference between a um, huge amount of money. Uh, I am curious, as you, as you see for yourself these next few years roll out, and as you know, 2012 passes and we get what we can get done and so forth, um, where do you see us going from a legal standpoint in the estate and gift tax arena? I mean, what, what, what do you think our, our trajectory is? Um, well, regrettably, this is all a political hot potato. Of course. Uh, the, the tax code would, and tax laws all originate out of the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. um, they're fighting over, to me, what amounts to peanuts when you've got a much more pervasive problem. Yeah. Depending upon, this is a very important election, as, uh, as a lot of us have been hearing uh, from the pundits, but it's, it's important on a number of levels. It depends what kind of a country we want to be. Yeah. Uh, if we have a Republican House of Representatives, uh, we're probably um, not going to get some major tax changes. Mm -hmm. That could be good, it could be bad, depending upon the circumstances you're in. If we wind up, with, if, if Obama gets reelected, and there's a pretty, probably a pretty good chance he will be. He's, mm -hmm. he's a very good politician. He's got a lot of money behind him. The Republicans seem to be a little bit uh, a little confused right now. Yeah. Uh, but I think if we, and I'm just forecasting now, but I think if Obama gets reelected, we're still going to have a, he, he won't control the House and the Senate again like he did the first two years of yeah. his presidency. So probably not a lot will get done. But we're going to have a continuing decline in the in, in the assets and and the economy and the and the mm -hmm. currencies, and people are still going to be very confused about what to do about it. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's it's important that that people like yourself are are getting this information out there so people know what to do because it, that the traditional ways of investing I think uh, are going to are going to take a backseat to to more conservative. Uh, types of investments, precious metals and so forth, where you you know you can get your money back. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I speak at these financial conferences and I have the benefit of sitting and listening to some of the, the most brilliant economists. And of course, most economists couldn't tell you what, what's going to happen. <laughs> but, I mean, if, if, you, if you just read um, the, the, about the basic laws of economics, yeah. you know, you realize that you... You, you, these things are not sustainable, and at some point we're going to have to uh, have a day of reckoning. So hopefully people, particularly the older people, who are looking at what to do with their estates, uh, how to invest their money, you know, take a more conservative approach. Take a time out right now. Yeah. And just don't do anything, uh, don't chase yields is, is the, I think, yeah. one of the greatest things, that the uh, greatest pieces of advice I hear at a lot of these conferences. Yeah, well, that's interesting. Um, and I agree with that. I mean, if you watch, uh, anybody watching my shows can see there's a certain direction that I feel we need to go. Um, and it's really to take responsibility for ourselves and our own money. It's always been the underpinning of asset protection. Don't l count on the legal system to protect you. In a, in a perfect world, our legal system should actually protect us and we shouldn't need asset protection. I've always argued asset protection is, it's, it's amazing that it exists or is even allowed to exist. Um, because uh, to be able to effectively opt out of the laws of the country in which we live um, is, uh, is really not supportive of those laws. But if those laws are corrupt and the system in which they're enforced is corrupt, which I believe they are, uh, I mean truly corrupt in, in the sense that they cannot be relied on anymore, then you have to do something and take that responsibility. Over the past 15 years, my concern is really more from legal to financial and financial system. And, and uh, unfortunately, I think we live in a, in a fundamentally corrupt society when it comes to the political infrastructure, the financial infrastructure, the legal in infrastructure. And um, you know, it, it's tricky, but I really appreciate what you're saying. Use that structure as it exists today to get yourself protected. It gives you more options, you know, regardless. You, you and I have been doing this a long time, this meaning asset protection. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, you know, the, 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 
the, the cases that really uh, get to me the most are the ones where you know you've had a client in the office you've talked about doing asset protection yeah. they didn't do it for whatever reason either they didn't feel they wanted to spend the money they didn't feel they were yeah. they, they were at risk and then they get hit with the proverbial lawsuit oh, and yeah. then they call you up and they want to come in and you know these people will put their money on mars if it means it's out of harm's way and unfortunately yeah. as you know because of the fraudulent transfer laws yeah. we can't do anything for them and th those are the people that i often wonder was there something more i could have said could, could i have been more dogmatic about my yeah. conversations with them but you know, all we can do as advisors is give them the best advice that we can, uh, and they have to make the ultimate decision. But too many people, I think, are still, they have their heads stuck in the sand. Yeah. They, they're, they're hoping that the system will take care of them, and we, we know that's just not a realistic approach. Well, it's, it's not even, even if the system wanted to, it can't. It's, it has been fundamentally handicapped by debt. Um, we're seeing in Europe, this is the canary in the coal mine. Um, what's going on is ultimately coming home to roost, and. It, my message is, it, as emphatically as possible, take care of yourself. And that yeah. means get safer. I love it. Get Focus on a return of your money in whatever capacity you ultimately deem that looks like. Um, not a return on your money. And you're right, people are stuck on yield. They cannot imagine not having a little bit of yield. And it's going to be the downfall of a lot of people chasing that. We're even seeing our clients go back to old traditional assets like life insurance. Yeah. You know, life insurance companies are, are really the strongest institutions financially out there. Uh, the, none of the top insurance companies, I don't think any insurance companies took any TARP money. No. They, uh, none of them went under. Uh, they're, they're paying much higher than, than commercial yields on their internal crediting of their policies. And, and, and a person, and, and they're very tax advantaged. You know, the t the t I don't know why the tax code allows this to happen. Well, it's because life insurance companies have a lot of money to lobby. <laughs> well, since 1913, if you bought a life insurance policy, any capital gains, interest, dividends, or royalty income yeah. inside the policy is tax-free. Right. <laughs> and if you die, the death benefit is, is income tax-free to the beneficiaries. Yeah. And if you structure the policy properly, it's creditor protected, yeah. and it's out of your estate. It doesn't get any better than that. And that's all right in the tax code. Yeah. Now, I don't know why Congress allows this to happen, but that's the way it's, it's, it's written. And, and if we don't take advantage of it, yeah. uh, we're being very foolish. So yeah. we're, we're finding people parking um, uh, their assets in, in traditional life insurance products uh, and, and getting some decent returns on them. But they know they're going to get return of their, of their capital. In fact, a lot of these carriers have now indexed products mm. where they can take advantage of certain uh, domestic and future indices uh, to try to goose up their return. They have principal protection. I know I sound like an insurance. Uh, yeah, salesman. which I know you're not. I'm but not, <laughs> but I mean, but I study this stuff, and yeah. I mean, you know, where can you buy a product where you've got downside risk on the on on the portfolio value going down? You, of course, your upside is going to be capped. The point is safety, as you say. Yeah. For, for until things get stabilized, until we know what's going to happen with Europe, until we know what's going to happen with our with our our, our currencies, just park, take a time out. And just yeah. be safe, and then and then look at things in a year or two from now. I think the timeout is 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 the key to that, and I agree. And if you didn't know what to do, if if you just said now I'm completely confused, just timeout. What does timeout look like? Take it all off the table. Sleep for 30 days and see how you feel. I told that to one client who couldn't just couldn't take a loss on this investment in, in a stock market portfolio, and I said do it. And in 30 days, you can go right back in right. and go right back to the position. He sold it. It was 24 hours later. He called me and said, oh, my God, this feels like a, a, a thousand pounds was lifted off my shoulder. Just being out of that fear of, of the well, market. Well, too many investors don't understand the relationship between pre-tax returns and after-tax returns. No. Too many investors focus on pre-tax returns. No. But it's how much you can spend after you paid Uncle Sam. And, and I think that's the more... Uh, the more rational way of looking at, at investments. So you're absolutely right. You know, something you said earlier that, that came to mind I wanted to mention. I find it's an interesting phenomenon. Many of our clients come to us from larger law firms, yeah. national firms, regional firms. And there's an, as, there's an attitude by the larger law firms against asset protection. The, yeah. fir the law firms true. don't offer it. Yeah. They don't. Well, that's the, there's your answer right there. They don't offer it. <laughs> well, but, they, but they have opportunities to offer, but yeah. they feel that asset protection planning is somehow some dirty yeah. uh, activity. But it's no different than if a client wants to start a business and they, and they have a decision to either do an unincorporated sole yeah. proprietorship right. or to form an LLC or a corporation. Yeah. Uh, they're protecting their assets, the personal assets, against what might happen at, at the company level. Right. And yet, very few law, big law firms uh, that, that I've, I've come into contact with or encountered are even willing to offer or suggest asset protection to their, to their clients. So 
So the viewers of yours that are, that are watching this or may watch in the future, if, you rep if you're represented by one of those big law firms and you haven't heard about asset protection, the reason is, is because the law firms don't like to offer it. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. so funny. I had a client whose uh, son was an associate at one of those big law firms. He called me and said, hey, we, we don't do it here. Can you do it? And <laughs> actually engaged me sure. for his parents um, because his firm didn't offer it. And uh, you're right. So, but I think it's changing. I think it actually is. People are, um, the community is looking at asset protection in, in a way where it's becoming necessary. Um, I, I'm waiting for the first case of an, you know, a, probably a big firm who didn't do it and the client lost significant money and turns around and bites the big firm for not advising that this was possible. Yeah, we, you, you and I have been saying this for years and I think we're, we're probably gonna be pretty close to something like yeah, that. Something that's gonna happen, so. Well, Jeffrey, pleasure. I mean, this is very interesting. Uh, you know, the perspective, I find that when you have a lot of inputs, a lot of different perspectives through the clients, you, you, you kind of are able to stand in that middle and, and make sense of it in a different way than um, when, when we're sitting in front of the TV just listening to that. You know. Well, I, I also think the role of the, of the law firm in relation to their clients is changing. We, we have to be more proactive, not just delivering legal services, but also because of all the contacts we have out there to help our That's clients right. be guided through the myriad of complexities that happen today. So I think more and more you're going to see the, the, our, our, our field evolving in that direction. Well, you know, the, the concept of us as counselors, I see my role as that. And it really extends beyond just what we do in, uh, in that particular area in which we, you know, we've been hired. I mean, really, we're counseling on the, you know, the entire picture when it comes to their world of money and legal and all of it. So, well, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on The Mind of Money. My name is Douglas Lodmel, and we'll see you next time.